Hello, and my name is Lowell Vanderpool, and this channel is dedicated to IT professionals, IT students, and anyone who's interested in technical subjects. This is part two of a series helping IT professionals and IT students go out and purchase used IT equipment and use them to leverage advanced training. We're talking about used servers in this series, and we're going to look at the setup and configuration of the software side of this equipment. In this scenario that I'm going to be talking about, I've got an HP ProLiant DL360. It's a Gen 8 1U rack mounted server. It's got two Xeon Core 64 gigs of RAM, eight SAS 300 gig hard drives, a enterprise RAID controller, four gigabit network cards, two power supplies. It didn't come with any operating system, and it was about $349 with a 90 day warranty. That's a pretty good deal for a U server. In this lecture, we're going to be covering with the U server, configuring the disk arrays, software downloads, firmware, software for your specific server operating system, drivers, and then out of band configuration. So, what's the purpose of buying U servers, switches, and routers? If you're an IT professional or IT student, there's no better way of getting hands on experience than having this equipment at home. Today, with ISPs giving you 200 megabit bandwidth, the ability to set up a network, even in a small apartment, lends itself to advancing your skill set, your experience in, in a way that you can't typically even at work. Some IT professionals, their workplace is such that they just don't have the opportunity to work with servers, work with routers, because the infrastructure guys do it or the server guys do it, and they just don't get the opportunity. Again, buy the equipment and start learning at home. This is so important with with IT students. The thing that IT students lack the most is experience. So go ahead and start looking and listening to this lecture series, getting carefully selected and affordable pieces of equipment, and start advancing your skill set. Get the hands-on you need. I don't know of a single employer who will not be encouraged by hearing that you've got this type of setup in your home to continue your skill building on your own. Now, I'm not for one minute suggesting that you need to put all all your time at work and then all your time at home advancing your careers. But just think of it, two nights a week, what a difference that would make over a period of 10 years. In the world of IT, getting hands-on experience, it's everything. Now, as I look at this hardware, I'm going to look at its hardware subsystem. I want to look at this U server and say, what kind of network bandwidth does it have? What kind of storage bandwidth and capacity does it have? How much CPU headroom do I have? And what kind of memory capacity and what kind of memory bandwidth do I have? So that I can focus on what I need to change. To get the maximum performance out of a used server, I look at this particular box. It's got two Xeon 6 core. I got plenty of CPU. It's got 64 gig. I got plenty of RAM. Ah, but I've got a 6 gig SAS RAID controller. So I've got about 600 megabytes per second. That's a little bit better than a typical SATA drive that's running 7200 RPM, but not much better. So right away I can see my biggest issue here is disk bandwidth and disk speed. Here I did a disk benchmark for that one drive. I took one drive put it on a RAID controller and ran a benchmark with a 300 gig SAS drive at 6 gigabits per second. Not too great. I'm getting at the best a 415 megabyte per second read and about a 415 write benchmark. That's not really good. If I put an operating system on that server like it is right now on a single drive, it's going to be extremely slow and it's not going to have the performance. So I need to leverage my disk array, my RAID system to improve that performance. The same server, same drive, same hard drive, same SAS controller, but I took 
discs, seven discs, and I put them in a RAID 0. Look at my benchmarks now. I went from 400 to over 2,600 read and about a 1,300 write. Substantial improvement on disc performance. My disc subsystem will definitely do fine if I put more discs in a RAID 0 configuration. Now, I am at risk because if any disc fails, I'm going to lose everything on the array. So that just means I'm going to have to do my job with backup. As I move to RAID 0 for my C drive and D drive, backups become real critical because anything fails in those RAID arrays, I'm going to lose everything in it. Got eight disks in this used server. So I'm going to take three disks, put them in a RAID 0 configuration and make that C drive. On controller 2, I'm going to take five disks that are left and make that a RAID 0 disk array. And I'm going to make that D drive. That will give me the balance between capacity, which I don't need as much capacity in C as I would like to have in a D because I'm going to put virtual machines in there. But it will give me enough performance boost that I can live with it for right now. When I'm dealing with laptops or desktops, older laptops, older desktops, my strategy is no different than what I'm using on this server. Generally, CPU is fine. If I'm purchasing used equipment, I'm always looking at best CPU that I possibly can buy, most ex expandable amount of RAM that that piece of hardware will do. And then when I look at storage, that's usually where the performance is the worst. So I look at some method of RAID, whether it's a laptop or a desktop, I use RAID. I try to go to, in, in the case of the server, I try to go to SSDs for my C drive. So here, Water Panther has some really cool options for older Dell and HP servers. They make enterprise two and a half inch drives that are SSDs. This one's 200 gigabyte for about $74 each. I could buy two of these, RAID 0 together, make them my C drive, and I would probably get read speeds at around 3K, 3.6K. That would be phenomenal. It would dramatically improve the performance of this used server with the least amount of dollars invested. And keep in mind, I'm still talking about a SAS 6 gigabit interface. So let's begin and let's configure the array. So here we're looking at the setup for the motherboard. We're going to hit F9. We're going into the main motherboard setup. We're going to look at the boot controller order. We have two controllers. We want to make sure the SAS array is the boot option. So we have the SAS array, which is the P420, and then the, in, the SATA controller. I want that SAS array, my boot, first boot option. And so then we're going to save those settings. We're also looking at the boot order for hard disks, and we're going to save that, and we're going to exit out. Server LED indicators give us significantly more information about the disks themselves and the array. As you watch the front panel of my server, you'll see a number of LEDs on on the hard drives, and a bunch of those hard drives look totally off. That's because they're not configured to an array, and they don't have a logical drive. Once the software goes out and talks to those drives, you'll see the blue light come on. They're being accessed by an application. I'm going to put them in a logical drive and say, OK, you'll see them come alive. They'll actually show an indicator. They'll show activity. There they are. They come online. They're showing activity and those are now put online. I'm accelerating the boot process using Video Magic about 10 times faster than it is. I'm going to choose F8 to run the optional ROM configuration for Arrays Utility. So here's our menu. We can create a logical drive, view a logical drive, delete a logical drive, select a boot volume. We're going to delete the existing logical drive. That's number one, one disk on a RAID 0. We're going to delete that. That's how the server came. We're going to hit F8. Now we're getting the warning. to It's going to delete it and wipe it. We're going to hit F3. And we're saving that configuration change. Press Enter to continue. And we'll go back and delete the next logical drive, which is all the rest of the drives in a RAID 0, 2 terabytes. We're going to F8. We're going to hit F3 and delete that, save that configuration. Let's go back to our menu. Let's create a logical drive and go into the actual controller menu. You can see, oh, there's all my disks. I see all my RAID configurations. Look at all the RAID configurations we can do. We can use spare drives, maximum boot partitions, different parity group counts. So it's a powerful, powerful RAID array system. 
So I'm going to build my C drive. I'm going to deselect all but three drives and put them in a RAID 0. Remember, I don't need the capacity of three drives, but I need the speed of three drives in a RAID 0 configuration. That's what I'm after, performance. So I'm selecting RAID 0, and I'm going to hit Enter to continue to build a logical array. We've selected those three drives in a RAID 0. We're going to hit F8 to save the configuration and we have our C drive. So we're going to go back to our menu. We're going to create one more logical drive. We're going to take the rest of the available disks and put them in a RAID 0. Remember, I'm after storage performance. I'm already dealing with slow drives and slow controller. So I'm after the maximum speed that I can get. We're going to hit Enter to continue. Create the logical drive. Hit F8 to save this configuration. And our server is complete. Let's go back and look at what we did. We're going to view the logical drives. There's logical drive 1, which is going to be our C drive. Logical drive 2 is going to be our secondary drive. Now we want to go in and select our boot volume. Which of these drives do we boot to? So we're going to do direct attached storage. We're going to try logical drive 0, which is going to be our C drive. So we want to make sure we set that boot drive. And then F8 and saving that configuration and we can now exit out of our menu and get ready to boot our server into an operating system. Out of band server management is probably one of the coolest features of servers. You don't have it in desktops, you don't have it in laptops. It's a way to access your hardware without disturbing the operating system that's running or production environment. You can actually go in and if need be, do a remote reboot, a shutdown, a power on, if it's off, change boot order. You can monitor all the temperatures and systems of your server. You you can do power management control. You can run diagnostics while the system is running. You can do remote control of the operating system via an out-of-band connection. You can do remote vendor support. You can log all your hardware events and look at them. And you can even include enterprise-wide management. Most out-of-band server management works off the idea of a dedicated chip that has firmware and you access it via the network, generally through a web browser. This gives you full out-of-band access to your hardware without disturbing or disrupting your production operating system and applications. Now, most servers have it. Dell servers use the iDRAC. HP uses the ILO, the Integrated Lights Out. Lenovo uses the Integrated Management Module. Intel uses is AMT, Active Management Technology. So a lot of server manufacturers provide some, some sort of out-of-band server management. Let's walk through the steps of configuring your out-of-band management. So we're booting up this server at a speed of about 15 times normal. So to configure ILO, we're going to hit F8, and we're in the configuration. We're going to go to set the TCP IP setting, and you can see I've got it 192.168.0.134, the subnet mask, and the gateway. And that's what I want. I want to assign a, a specific IP address to this ILO or this out-of-band network connection. So this is my existing user, John, and I gave it a very secure password. If you were to add a user, it would look like this, and you would give it a username, a login name, and then a very, very strong password. You do not want people in this server out of band unless they're valid users. Here you can see, can they be an administrator? Here we can look at some of the advanced functionalities of ILO. You can go in there and change these. We're going to get enable all of these except RBUS logon and we're going to be done with the basic configuration of out of band. Now I've launched my browser to 192.168.0.134 and this is what I see. I've logged on, I've created that account in the BIOS and now I'm logged on with that account and you can see it's amazing. I can go to HTML5 and actually launch a HTML5 remote desktop console. It gives me all the capabilities of, of actually logging on and working with this operating system out of band. So if for some reason I couldn't get access to it any other way, if I could get access to it this way, I could actually work on the server. I can see the health status. It's okay. Server power, UDI, which we'll get into later. And it just gives me an overall view of this particular PC. As I go down, I'm going to go to system information. And this is where it gets really cool. Let it load. 
So I'm looking at system information and you can see all the information that I need to know just in a quick dashboard view. So I can see my status of all the critical hardware. If I go to fans, I can see my fan status, temperatures, pretty extensive temperature list and quickly look at the green uh, power. I look at my power supplies and see their status. I can look at my processors and see their status. It gives me a lot of information about them. Look at memory and see the status of all my DIMMs, my network, a good bit of information about my network cards, device inventory. These are all the major plug-in devices onto the server. My four port ethernet, my RAID array storage. Gives me a detailed look at my storage, my logical drives, my physical drives. Quickly allow me to look at all that. I can see my firmware, what version, what, what is that firmware that I need to look at. And so I can see all of that. This is great out of band information. I can look at my event log, look at all the events that have happened on this particular PC. I can look at diagnostics. I can run various diagnostics. I can do a reset on the ILO if necessary. I have remote control capability. Virtual media, I can boot to different kinds of virtual media. So I can set boot order here, power management, and adjust how the server is working with power management. Totally out of band. I'm not impacting the server at all while it's in production. How to download the firmware and drivers and software needed for your particular operating system is probably the most challenging of everything you do on your server. For example, a PC may have firmware for a video card and a motherboard, and you may never upgrade them or mess with them. But on a server, you may have eight devices, eight firmware packages that have to be upgraded on a regular basis. Now, if you purchase a license from HP or Lenovo or Dell, you can pretty much get their service pack software, their firmware package, and a very easy management system to install it. But if you're buying used hardware, you typically don't have that luxury, or at least you don't want to spend that extra money. So you have to go back to the vendor's website and meticulously and carefully organize your software downloads, your driver downloads, and begin the process of installing manually. Again, the same approach I use when I'm installing drivers on a laptop or a desktop, I use for my servers. I don't change my method at all. I create folders somewhere on my desktop for each software driver a package. I also in that folder create a document with all the instructions for each driver. I go after chipsets, video, RAID, NIC are always where I begin first. Then firmware because that's more challenging. Then operating system drivers. Again, same, create the folder, a document showing all the installation uh, to do's and don't do's. And then I begin the process of installing very very systematically and logically. I use this same approach no matter what piece of hardware I'm dealing with, whether it's server, desktop, or laptop. Now this portion is critical to getting your server up to date on firmware so it's patched and less vulnerable and to give your operating system of choice, whether it's Linux, Windows, or whatever, the most stability. Without doing this, you're gonna probably have an unstable operating system. So in gathering my drivers, firmware, software, anything that I'm gonna need for the software side of this server configuration, I'm gonna to go to the, the vendor's homepage for drivers, etc. I've got the HP ProLiant Deal 360P Gen 8 server, and it's got, it's really got everything. It just, if you can, for the service pack license, they make it very, very easy. If not, you're back to this homepage and you have to do everything manually. I can see my BIOS downloads, firmware, documentation manuals for, it's all here. It just takes more time. It requires you to do all the hard work. I'm gonna scroll down through here and be loading server 2016. A lot of the software related to Microsoft is probably gonna be on my list potentially have 65, probably not. Because remember, server 2016 comes with a lot of the existing drivers that I need for that server. I'm probably going to have to only update a certain amount. Here I can see drivers, firmware, software. There's a lot to do and get organized. Do this carefully. Now down here is really nice. They've got critical, recommended, and optional. So I definitely want to look at critical. I want to go for anything that's critical that I have in this particular server and make sure that I do that. As it relates to firmware, I'm gonna go into my ILO and I'm into the ILO of the server and I've went, clicked on the system information and I clicked on the firmware tab. And here I can see all my firmware ROMs that are on this motherboard or on the controllers. 
I can see their version and in some cases their date. So I'm going to use that. I'm going to cut that out, put it in a Word document and use that to make sure if I see that I'm up to date, then I don't need to download that firmware or update any of that area. I need to know that. So this is great. So I'm going to use that as a basis for my decision making. So here's what I've finished. I've got my server software and I've, what I do is I create a folder for each specific piece of software or firmware. So this is agent, agentless management service for Windows X64. And what I do is I create a folder with a very descriptive name, put the driver in. I'm going to open it up. So I've got the driver. This is that CP032256.exe. I also grabbed the installation instructions. I also want that. I want to make sure as I, before I start that driver, install, I read any of the to-dos and not to-dos, and I make sure I do that. And I can see right here that there's a channel interface driver for X64 that has to be installed. So I want to make sure I go after that. Sometimes on that web page, it's hard to find that specific thing. So many times I'll just take the information, channel interface driver for X64. I'll copy that out. I'll go up here to Google, and I'll just use I'm going to copy that in and I'm going to use that for a basis to search. And a lot of times that'll get me right to the driver that I need. I'm not wasting any time looking on that list. So that's one. I Now I'm back to my folders. I've got all the documentation. If there's a PDF, I download that. I've got the driver. And uh, like I said, as I look at these documents, I can see I need that channel driver. I also need to go to my server and install the role of SNMP. So I'm going to go to the server, get that service installed. So that is done. And I shouldn't have any problem putting that in. Now I am doing all this on my desktop. I never take my server and surf the internet. Never take your server and surf the internet. Do not take your server to the internet. Don't do it at work. Somebody will kill you. Your boss will kill you. Take your workstation, go get these drivers, put them on your local hard drive, and then you can migrate them to a flash drive, take them into the server room, pop them in, and load them locally. Never take your server to the internet. So I've got all my drivers. I've did all that I said I did, and I've got Word documents or documents that can contain the instructions, prerequisites, and based on that, I was able to create this list of things that I need. And I was able to walk down through video drivers, chipset drivers, all the power management firmware. I do firmware last, but get everything in and was able to get all of this installed on the server. When you do it this way, it just goes really, really well. Now, if I have a driver, let's say one of these doesn't go in. A lot of times I'll wait till I get everything else in and I'll go back to it and try it again. Sometimes something had to be done before another that wasn't in the documentation. So I'll, I'll go ahead and finish as much as I can get done. I'll make a note of what didn't work. And then when I'm all done with everything, I start going back to those items that didn't finish. And a lot of times they'll go in now. Something had to be done prior. Uh, it wasn't in the documentation and you just you'd learn by trial and error. When I finished this list, I only had like two items that I could not get installed. So it took a while. I had to go back more than once and try again. But by the time I was done, almost everything was installed and working. So last of all, I want to show you some of the tools, third-party software that I put on my server just for additional information. So one, I put the Crystal Disk benchmarking tool. And you can see with three disks in a RAID array, I went from 500 bytes per second to about double. So that was that gave me a much better uh, read and write performance on my C drive. My CPU Z is a free download, great tool, uh, gives me information about my motherboard, memory, graphics, things that are very helpful to know about the server. And then CPU hardware monitor gives me a Win32 view of all my temperatures, utilization, etc. on all the sensors on the motherboard. My other favorite is Patch My PC. It's a free download download, it allows me to keep all my third-party software patched and up to date. So I hope you enjoyed this and we'll take a look at hardware next.